Good morning, Duck Church. How's everybody today? <laughs> Got a little discipline problem. All right. Well, let's stand and join together in song. Lift it up to the Lord.
y'all can have a seat for a moment. So in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 3, verse 2, Paul wrote, the only letter of recommendation we need is you yourselves. Your lives are a letter written in our hearts. Everyone can read it and recognize our good work among you. You know, Christians are walking epistles written by God, read by men. That means that we're the only Bible some people will ever read. They'll form an opinion about God based on what they think of us. And yeah, that's a lot of pressure. But we're his representatives. and We can't escape the fact that we're examples. All that we determine is whether we're good examples or poor ones. See, we are to be examples of those who are watching us. One thing that seemed to permeate society today is a sense of hopelessness. But as Christians, we have hope. And we need to deliver it. We need to tell others there is hope in this world. There is purpose. There is meaning. Writing to the church in Thessalonica, Paul said, We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. Paul understood that God called him not only to preach the gospel, but to live it as well. The problem we have today is that sometimes we edit the gospel. We leave out things that we think will offend people. But if we're going to share the gospel, we need to give the entire gospel. Any gospel that offers forgiveness from God without saying that we need to repent of our sins is not the gospel. The essential message of the gospel is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the message that we need to convey. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come here today to worship and to praise you. We come here today and thank you for the free grace that you gave us through the death and resurrection of your Son, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and was raised from the dead. And it's in his holy name that we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and sing We Fall Down. <laughs>
you could take a moment and pass the peace, shake somebody's hand, tell them welcome to Duck. Rockin' Shane, you are rockin', man. friends. So before we get to the uh, children's message this morning, we've got a celebration because we've got somebody joining our church today. So if you will turn on page 34 and Bruce, won't you come on up? And you can come with him if you want to. You can come stand with him if you want to. He doesn't have to stand by himself. So we're on page 34 in the in the the blue the blue hymnal. And uh, at the first service this morning, uh, Larry and Molly Lahan joined church. So uh, you make three today. So that's that's a good biblical number. Thank you. <laughs> so Bruce, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I do. And do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And according to the grace given to you, will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? I will. And congregation, we're going to take a little trip over to page 38. Two more questions. Real easy. As, members of Christ, as a member of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministry? And as a member here at Duck Church, which we all love so well, uh, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Members of the household of God, I commend Bruce to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love.
little antiphonal thing going on this morning. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Bruce, it is my pleasure to be the first to welcome you officially to Duck Church and to present you with your certificate of membership. And would you join me in making Bruce feel welcome as a member of our church? Yay! All right, we're going to get to the children's moment in just a minute, but first, while we're, before, before I do that, let me uh, pass around the clipboard. Um, so we're going to be having a series of cottage meetings, we're calling them, and the first one will be tomorrow night at 6.30. And there's a, a bunch of papers here, a bunch of different dates. So we'll start tomorrow night, and then we've got two each week during the month of March. The purpose of these is to, uh, it will be centered around four questions, and uh, I want to know your hopes and longings for Duck Church. Uh, I want to know how the church has helped you to grow spiritually. I want to hear those stories, and a couple of other questions that we'll uh, deal with as well. So if you would like to sign up for uh, a meeting, um, make sure when it gets to the back, Fran, can you get it across to the other side and we'll work our way up this side because we don't have but one clipboard. But just look through, there's uh, several dates there and find one that uh, looks good for you. It'll be 6.30 each evening at the Parsonage and uh, the address is there on the clipboard. So if you need to make a, a note of that, please do that. All right, James and other guys and gals, are we ready? Are we ready for the children's time this morning? Come on up. Yeah, he's ready. Yeah, he is. Yes! Wow. All right. Justin, come on, man. <laughs> there we go. Come on. Room for everybody today. So um, I wanted to follow up today, and I wanted to talk about something called the golden rule. Who knows what the golden rule is? And no, it's not those who have the gold rule. It's not that one. What is the golden rule? Have you ever heard of it? No. Nope. nope. You haven't heard? Anybody heard of the golden I, rule? I you, have. You've heard of it? Do you know exactly what it is? I can't remember. Okay. How about if, how about if I help you? Maybe you can help me uh, do unto others, others as, as you would have, have others do unto you. There you go. So you knew it. Yeah, good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm leaving you out of here. So what, what does that mean? So what it means is that we want to treat others in the same way we would want others to treat us. So would we want others to say bad things about us? No, we wouldn't, would we? I mean, that, that can hurt our feelings. That can upset us. And so it's really important, and what I'm going to talk to uh, folks about today is it's important not to say bad things about other people. You know, the Bible calls that slander. Slander. And that's a bad thing. God doesn't have much patience for that. So we want to live by the golden rule and do to others what we would have them do to us. Treat others in the same way we want others to treat us, okay? That's, that's a good rule. That's why it's called the golden rule. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you that you treat us with kindness, with love, and with forgiveness. Help us to treat others the same. Help us to treat others in a way that we would want them to treat us and to live by the golden rule. Give us the strength to do that in our homes, in our schools, and in our play. We pray in Jesus' name, and we say, Amen. Amen. And what's the thing that's flying over there? That thing that's flying over there. I don't know. That's, it looks like a, a reflection off of somebody's watch or something, maybe. Look. Oh, there it goes. Woo. <laughs> Look at there. <laughs> well, that's so cool. There you go. That was really good of you to see that, James. Yeah, that's so That was very cool. Yeah, anything you want. Yeah. You got a green one? You want a green one? What do you think? Lots of things to choose from. What do you think? All of them are good, I promise. Yeah? No? 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 
It's got to be something good in the bottom. Uh, yep. yep. That's chocolate. <laughs> nope. Yep. Yep. He found one. Right. He found one. Awesome. Awesome. Come on, guys. Lots of things. Oh, oh, there you go. All right, good. Good, good, good. So before we get to our offering, uh, John Park is going to come and share with us this morning that we had a, uh, a group go from our church down to Ocracoke to help uh, people recover from the storm, and John's given us a report. Good morning, church. I'm here to give you a report on our first Project Serve Ocracoke trip to help the recovery efforts uh, from Hurricane Dorian that happened last September. Four of us left Southern Shores Marketplace last Sunday for Ocracoke, Mark uh, Batenik, uh, Scott Kessler, Marty Miller, and me. We met up with two men just south of Nags Head, Richard Holliday and Chris Farr, who happens to be Chris Eidlitz's nephew and an employee of Wes Liverman. Thank you, Wes, for letting those guys come down. They've, I'll, I'll, I'll get into it. They brought their truck with all the tools and supplies, and we ate from that thing all three days we were down there. Then we, uh, not literally ate, we worked from that. Then we met up with Larry Bray at the Hatteras Ferry for a one-hour ride to Ocracoke. It was dark when we arrived, so we didn't really know what condition the island was in uh, until the next day. Five months after the storm, there was still debris from buildings, appliances, and other wreckage piled along the main highway into and through the town. We slept, ate, breakfast and had devotional time in a rental house on the north shore of the island that has been donated for volunteers since the storm, just after the storm. All of the homes in that area seem to have new roofs and no boat docks. Not that they didn't want boat docks, they were gone. Um, we met in the dining hall of the Ocracoke United Methodist Church each day to get assignments. They served breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, for volunteers, but we ate breakfast in our lodging packed uh, sandwiches for lunch and ate on the economy for dinner. When the construction director uh, that first morning said there was decking and stairs to complete at the parsonage for church, Larry Bray leaned over and whispered, that sounds like a lot of fun. So I said, we'll take that one. Um, I have to admit, I was at first uh, disappointed that we were going to be working on the United Methodist Parsonage. It just seemed like there were so many other people in need outside the church. Then God brought to memory Galatians 6, 9, and 10 that says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those of the household of faith. So I, I get it, God. Uh, the parsonage on Howard Street um, was at ground level during Hurricane Dorian. Pastor Susie and her husband Tom uh, weathered the storm inside the parsonage. When dawn came, they went down, and, and it didn't look too bad. Um, but then the water started to rise around the house, and within minutes, it was seven feet within the house, and they were up in the attic to, to uh, save themselves from it. Since the storm, the parsonage was raised up and moved back 15 feet to protect it from future flooding. The inside was gutted completely, only studs. Uh, this is what we saw on the outside when we arrived at our job site. The deck girders, some of the joists, and all of the steps were finished. This is the back of the house uh, that only had uh, the two pilings beyond the, uh, the house there and the, the, the uh, part that's uh, jutting out. Um, we installed the girders, joists, and rail posts before stopping work until more pilings could be installed this coming week. We installed the rest of the joists, deck boards, rail posts, railings, and pickets. Here you see the rail caps going on the deck, le on the deck level up above. Garth Adams joined us uh, mid-morning on Monday to make a total of eight. We also installed posts to support the roof that covered a small porch when the house was on the ground. Larry and Marty were our crew, crew leads. Uh, they both had to leave on Tuesday, but they worked hard to get us to a place where the remaining non-experts could finish the job on Wednesday. And there you see 
the kicks maintenance truck in the background there. We just pilfered everything from them. And this is where we started on Wednesday. We needed to put on railings, pickets, and caps for the lower level steps. And this is the finished job and the team that stayed until Wednesday. We headed to the ferry about 2 p.m., but didn't get on until 6.15 p.m. because uh, the abundance of priority vehicles on the 3.30 and 4.30 ferries. Patience was definitely the watchword of the afternoon. Um, we're planning to head down again for a full week in, in May, and I say a full week. Probably five days is the most that some of us older folks can handle down there, but uh, they're working six days a week down there. Uh, that's the next time that they'll have lodging for us is in May. Stay tuned for sign-up clipboards and announcements, and thanks for your support and your prayers. In obedience to Jesus' words to love others as we love ourselves, to do good, bless and pray for friends and enemies alike, let us now do to others as we would like to have them do to us, offering our tithes and gifts for the sake of those who are in need. this song, you're welcome to sing along. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every life.
even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. So as we um, consider prayer requests this morning, uh, let me just uh, give you an update on um, baby Asher. Um, we've been praying for Asher now. He's three weeks old. He went through a 15-hour open-heart surgery, and a team of doctors met with the family yesterday and told them that he would never leave, leave the ICU. Um, he, his, his heart, lungs, and kidneys cannot function apart from the machine. So they made the heart-wrenching decision yesterday to begin to wean him off of that today. And um, they moved him to a room. Um, it's really hard. They haven't been able to hold him but one time. And um, so they, they moved him to a room where they can be with him and, and hold him. Uh, as he dies so um, Robbie is the dad Jordan is the mother and then the grandparents my friends uh, Branson and Teff Sheets and uh, Branson is the pastor at um, Covenant United Methodist in outside of Greenville in Winterville so please uh, keep the Sheets family in your prayers um, it's a hard time very hard time for them are there others uh, on this side first? Any other prayer concerns, prayer needs? Anyone over here? Okay. What about over on this side? Yes. Okay. What's Caroline's husband's name? Jeremy. Jeremy. Jeremy and Caroline. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Let's, let's go to the Lord as we pray. Lord, we thank you that uh, Jeremy and Caroline are not strangers to you. You, you knew them as you formed them in the womb, and uh, you know the plans that you have for them. 
and Lord, we pray for both of them as they one is facing surgery and the other is having some uh, serious uh, stomach issues that you would be their healer. Lord, we also lift up the Sheets family to you today. We pray that in the midst of this unbearable time that you would be present that your love, your comfort, your grace would be what would get this family through this time. Lord, we lift up Robbie and Jordan. We lift up Asher. We lift up Branson and Teff and the rest of the family. We pray that they would draw close to one another and draw on their faith reserves in you. Lord, we know that faith is sometimes all we have, but it's all that we need. Someone has said that faith is not being able to see, but trusting in the one who can. And so in all of our ways, we trust in you. We acknowledge you as the Lord and the giver of life. And we pray that you would be near to the brokenhearted this day. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So the scripture today comes from James chapter 4, 11 through 17. Listen for the word of God. Don't, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town and we will stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So here's a fun fact for you. Guess which sin the Old Testament denounces more than any other? Adultery? Homosexuality, murder, drinking, dancing, or breaking the Sabbath? No, it's slander. Speaking against others and speaking against God. The Old Testament has more to say about this sin than any other. Among the verses are Leviticus 19, 16, Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. David wrote in Psalm 101, I will not tolerate people who slander their neighbors. Solomon advised, a gossip tells secrets, so don't hang around with someone who talks too much. And those are just a few examples, and more can be found in the New Testament. 1 Peter 2.1 tells us to put aside all malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Colossians 3.8 says... Put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Ephesians 4.31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. The Bible is clear on this subject, as it is with many subjects, and leaves little room for doubt. Talking bad about people is a big sin, one which God will not tolerate. So why is it then that so many Christians tolerate this sin in their own lives? In chapter 1, James addresses the sins of the tongue. In chapter 3, he addresses it again. 
And now in chapter 4, he comes at it yet again. Will we get the message? God expects believers to take seriously what they say, and he will not tolerate slander, gossip, or evil conversation. Now, this is a fundamental principle of Christianity, and it is a key part to living the Christian life. I know believers who would never seriously consider committing sexual sin or would never think of stealing from their employer, but they don't bat an eye about the idea of bad-mouthing someone they don't like. And they have their ways of justifying it, of course. This person is in error, and I need to expose their error. Or this person is in sin, and I need to expose their sin. Or this person did something wrong to me, and I need to let everybody know about it. Therefore, it's okay if I speak against them because I'm right and they're wrong. Now, if someone is in sin, the Bible gives us guidelines on how to deal with that, and it never involves broadcasting their sin to the world. You deal with it one-on-one. -on -one. And if that doesn't resolve the issue, then you bring it to spiritual leaders to let them bring resolution to the issue. But you never have permission to speak against a brother or sister in Christ. In James 4, this is how he says it. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. Do you see the connection that James is making here? Speaking against someone and judging someone are closely related. And we know that we're not to judge one another. Jesus said it plainly in Matthew 7, 1. Do not judge lest you be judged. When you say something bad about someone, you're judging that person, according to James, and he who speaks against or judges another, James says, speaks against the law and judges the law. James goes on to say in verse 12, God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Now this is the key verse in this passage, and it's a good phrase to commit to memory. Who are you to judge your neighbor? This phrase reveals the proper perspective each of us should have about ourselves. Who am I to judge my neighbor? Now, I know people who see themselves as watchdogs of the church. They see it as their job to keep an eye on others. If they see someone conducting their ministry in a way that they don't like, or if, they, if, if someone preaches something they don't agree with, they believe that it is their job to sound the alarm. The problem, as James indicates in verse 11, is that they themselves aren't d doers of the law. They're just trying to be everyone else's judge and trying to establish themselves as the final authority on the law of God. Now, I just, I have to say, with sadness, it's happened in several churches that I've worked with, not in this one, Amy, but here's what happens. Members will come in and say, I don't like the way youth ministry is done around here. They shouldn't be doing this. They should be doing that. Instead, they should do this, and they, they shouldn't do that. And I don't like the youth minister, and I think the youth minister gets paid too much money, and on and on it goes. And without fail, in my experience, this person is just like the person that James describes in verse 11. They don't want to be involved in doing. They just want to be involved in judging. And so James challenges us with the question, who am I to judge my neighbor? And there's a principle that he's teaching in this passage, as there is in all the passages that we've looked at in the book of James. And if we'll adopt this principle and make it a habit in our lives, we will lose all interest in judging others. It is the principle of humility. Now, the closer I get to God, 
the more I realize how far I've yet to go to be truly like Jesus. I mean, quite frankly, I don't have the luxury of standing in condemnation of others because I got too much going on in my own life to take care of. Can I get an amen? amen. I mean, I can't look down on others who fail from time to time because I got my own struggles. And when I read James chapter 4, I realize he's talking to me. In fact, he's talking to all of us. Many years ago in a Bible study at church, one of the guys in the group, we'll call him Jim, had a way about him of, of making people feel like they didn't quite measure up to his standard. And one night during the discussion, the group was asked to share their struggles, and Jim shared his, his struggle with the group. And he said this, I have a problem with spiritual pride. I get impatient with people who don't live up to what they profess, and I often look down on people who aren't where they should be spiritually. So please pray for me so I won't be so judgmental. And after a brief pause, the pastor asked incredulously, spiritual pride? You? What in the world do you have to be proud about? And everyone in the room laughed, except Jim. Now, it's interesting that while the rest of the group were admitting to things like lust and anger and laziness, Jim's primary struggle seemed to be how to deal with the fact that he was so much better than the other people in the group. And the saddest part of this is that Jim's spiritual pride made him oblivious to the faults in his own life. That's what pride does to us. It causes us to ignore the things in our own life that need to be improved and causes us instead to focus on what's wrong with everyone else. Now, we often use the word pride to describe that attitude, but there's another word for it, a more-in-your-face kind of word, an ugly word, arrogance. Arrogance is the attitude that says, I'm above it all. I'm better than everyone else. My opinion is more important than your opinion, and the rules don't apply to me. Now, this is the attitude that James is attacking in this passage. Verse 13, Look here, you who say, Today or tomorrow we're going to a certain town, and we'll stay there for a year, we'll do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while, and then it's gone. What you ought to say is if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own pretentious plans and all such boasting is evil. So what's James saying here? He's not saying that it's wrong to make plans or engage in business or to expect a profit. If you're in business, you have to plan in advance and you better expect to make a profit or you won't be in business long. That's not the problem. James is speaking against the arrogant attitude that causes us to think that we are the masters of our own universe, that we're in control of our own destiny, and that we can go here or there or wherever we want, and we don't need God's help along the way. And if you're not careful, you can easily convince yourself that you are the most important person on the planet. Charles de Gaulle was once quoted as saying, when I want to know what France thinks, I ask myself. Apparently, he saw the rest of the country as just an extension of himself. Hegel said, I may say with Christ that not only do I teach the truth, but that I am myself truth. Our own former president, Woodrow Wilson, said rather arrogantly in his proposal for the League of Nations in the early 20th century, and I quote, why has Jesus Christ so far not succeeded in inducing the world to follow his teachings in matters of world peace? It is because he taught the ideal without devising any practical means of attaining it. That is why I'm proposing a practical scheme to carry out his aims. Can you imagine that? Woodrow Wilson thought Jesus had some good ideas, but he just wasn't quite savvy enough to get them implemented. Good thing for the world that Woodrow Wilson was willing to step up to the plate. It's like the rooster who thought that the sun rose just to hear him crow. And aren't we all like that sometimes? 
Don't we sometimes behave as if we believe that the world exists just to hear us crow? James puts it in perspective for us. In verse 14, he says, your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. Now, you've heard me preach about how God loves you and how you're important to him and that your life can have meaning and purpose for all eternity, and that's true. But we've got to keep this truth in perspective. Without God, we are nothing. Without God, our lives are insignificant. Like Humphrey Bogart said to Ingrid Berg Bergman in the last scene of Casablanca, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the problems of two people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. If in our arrogance, we sometimes forget this, you get the idea that the, that the whole world revolves around you. James challenges us to remember that God is the center of the universe. Not you, not me, not my problems, not your problems, not my goals or your goals, not my plans or your plans. God's will is all that matters. Your purpose here on this planet is to follow his plan for your life, not your own. That's why we need to embrace this principle of humility. Humility causes us to remind ourselves, I'm not the center of the universe. God is. Now, James concludes this section by challenging our arrogance once more, as if we haven't been challenged enough. He says, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. And we should all cringe when we hear that. Now, if you've grown up in church, You've probably heard all your life about sins of omission and sins of commission. The sins of commission are the sins that you perform outright, lying, stealing, cheating, and so on. The sin of omission is the sin of doing nothing, not taking action when you should. And usually that involves helping others. You have an opportunity to give to someone in need, but you don't do it. You have an opportunity to speak a word of encouragement to someone who is discouraged, but you don't. You have an opportunity to invest some time in a ministry activity, but you stay at home. It is the sin of not taking action. And it's driven by the attitude that says, I'm, in too, I'm too important to be bothered with this. My time is too valuable. My money belongs to me. So you can just leave me out of it. The sin of omission is another expression of pride and arrogance. The more we embrace the principle of humility, the less likely we are to ignore opportunities to do good. So how does, does one embrace the principle of humility? In these final moments, here are three things that will help you. First, remember that you're not in a position to pass judgment on anyone. Verse 12, so what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Second, keep God at the center of your plans. Verse 15, what you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. And third, never ignore an opportunity to do good to someone else. Verse 17, remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Arrogance says, I'm the most important person in the world. Other people don't matter. God's word doesn't matter. God's will doesn't matter. It's all about me. Humility says, God, you are first in my life. What can I do for you? What can I do for others? And Duck Church, that's where we need to be. Let's pray. God, how patient you are with us. How patient. How many times, maybe we don't put it into words that way, but how many times do we live as if we're the center of the universe? that if it is to be, it is up to me. How many times do we live like Christian atheists? 
not trusting in you, not depending on you, not seeking to do your will but our own. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us when we slander others and justify it. Forgive us when we speak bad of others. Help us, Lord, to be the church you call us to be, the church this community and world needs us to be, the Christians the world needs to see. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing to the Lord. Give me eyes to see more of who you May what I behold still my anxious heart. Take what I have known and break it all apart. For you, my God, are greater still. And no sky contains, no doubt restraints, all you the greatness of our God. I spent my life to know, and I'm far from close to all you are. The greatness of our God. Give me grace to see.
And I hope you'll come back next Sunday. We're in the home stretch on our series on James, and I know our, our bruised toes will be glad to move off of James because James has been stomping all over us every week. Um, but we're going to be looking at uh, James 5, 1 through 12, and the message will be made to last. I hope that you'll be here. And now let's receive this blessing. May the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, nourish and sustain us, surprise and reorder us, and strengthen us in faith and hope for this life and for the life to come. Amen. And no sky.